So uh, one of the things that we heard from uh, David Driscoll when he was here a couple of years ago, reiterating much of what you said this morning, was that um, it, together with the political will, it took a significant investment of public dollars. Right. So um, it, Tim's dark cloud this morning <laughs> <laughs> regarding the state budget um, has the I, I know that that you can't start with the money because right. if you did, you'd never get off square one. Right. But I wonder if um, any of the discussions that you've had, both within your group or with the leadership in the state, um, has talked about the importance of investment and how that might happen. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, not in any detail. I mean, I think it's obvious. I'll say it's obvious. Probably not going to be done this time around, but we need to relook at the funding formula and how that's distributed. And the last time I believe that the funding formula was looked at, unfortunately, the first ground rule was no new money. So you're shuffling the deck. And there's a certain amount of that. People will say they'll look at how much we spend per pupil and how much Massachusetts spends, about the same. So is it being allocated the right places? Well, you know, the ugly secrets in that is it's in contracts and pensions and things there. Um, but until we can formalize what they are and look at what it takes, I think, you know, inevitably things are more expensive. Um, Tim mentioned unfunded mandates, which are the killer in everything. So it, my understanding in the curriculum reforms being looked at in the legislation, there's going to need to be more uh, teacher development on that. There's going to be need training dollars. And without committing anything, I think everybody's got to participate. So behind this effort, we put up the Rhode Island Foundation, just to get this off the ground, we put up $150,000. And the Partnership for Rhode Island, which is a, a, a large corporate group, put up $100,000. Philanthropy, cities and towns, business community will, will need to step up on this. And we need the discipline. So I say this, it, it, and people will argue in some, but a lot of people, if I walk down the street and I said, hey, would you pay $200 more a year in taxes if you absolutely knew ironclad it was going to improve our public education system? And a lot of people will say two things. Yes, but I don't believe it will go to education. We've got to get around that. 911, the lottery money was supposed to be for education. Um, that's what we need to do is stay. But to, to this point, it would be silly. Now, if you look at the size of our budget, and I'm, uh, are you taping this? I'm going to get in trouble for this. So <laughs> I, said, I would like to believe that this state, if the priority is on education, could spend an additional $10 million a year for 10 years, $100 million. Now, you look at the size of our budget, you look at today, and you say you're nuts, because it is nuts right now. But it depends on your priorities. We have to get back and hold our elected officials accountable that budgets are value statements. They're not just numbers. They're where do you place your chips? So, I don't know. You know, I told you we're working on health and health care. The dream is can we save money on health care and allocate to education? I don't know. All I know is healthier kids do better in school and better educated adults are healthier. That's where the synergy is. So somewhat of an answer. Marian. Somebody else had uh just a uh, quick question with regard to the, the finances. Recently I saw a chart that I believe represented that something like only 29%, 27% of the uh, courses being taught in Rhode Island have textbooks that are even aligned mm -hmm. to the Common Core curriculum. Right. So we're the, the, uh, around the state, many of the school districts are totally different. I'm from Portsmouth. Yeah. I don't think the case applies to Portsmouth so much. So I'm speaking up on behalf of the others who've had um, um, no increase in their budgets, their school budgets, for years. But the biggest, one of the biggest losses is the textbook. How can you possibly expect students to do well on these programs when you don't even have textbooks that are aligned to, yeah. the, uh, to the curriculum? Yeah, so my understanding, to me no more, on the work that's being done on curriculum is to not make it exactly standard across the state, but make it more uniform. And so that cities and towns don't have to go for the cheapest off the bottom shelf 1999 curriculum because they can't afford it. Where the money comes from, whether there's synergy in, in you know, bulk purchasing or something like that. Uh, but clearly, the teaching in the classroom and whatever they need to support it has to match the curriculum and then show up in the testing. So not in, something that we've addressed. It is a very local issue, but I, 
I'm hoping that in the legislation and in that process, it's, it's being looked at. Yeah, I, and I'll just yeah. throw my two yeah, cents in. Uh, it, we're talking about curriculum frameworks yeah. so that you, uh, you know, an innovative school that can access open source material, which is on the internet and is free and aligns with the curriculum frameworks could basically do it, I wouldn't say for nothing, but at right. considerably less expense normally. So it, then it becomes a question of ensuring that all of the students are not left behind because of a digital divide. So we've got to get one-on-one -on -one things like uh, Chromebooks and laptops. And if the, the schools are innovative, they don't have to go to Pearson to buy it off the rack. They can find a lot of open source material that would align with the curriculum frameworks. I'm sorry. To no, interrupt. no, no, that's right. And, and the other thing that goes along with that, I didn't mention, is one of the frustrations that a lot of people have, whether it's the teachers and the unions or parents stuff, we do too many flavors of the moment. We do too many pop-up programs. We do things for press releases. You know, it's fine to have a computer in every classroom. If the kids can't read, it doesn't do you any good. We've got to focus and, and, and do the things that are needed to drive whatever the curriculum is. Uh, please know I'm, I'm not here to brag, but I am a Massachusetts teacher living in Rhode Island. And one thing I, that I think you need to say more of is that you did use the word investment. And that really was the key, at least in my experience, to the growth in the MCAS scores in Massachusetts. 20 years ago when I used to teach a lot of summer school, the money that was given to me and several other teachers was MCAS tutoring money. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, my school district hired an MCAS teacher mm -hmm. in math an MCAS teacher in English. And that's where a lot of the investment, a lot of the money came. And I, and I think um, the Massachusetts did mm -hmm. provide a lot more of the funds mm -hmm. that I've seen as a school committee member yeah. uh, to the Rhode Island schools. No, that's great. So thank you. Yeah, that is one of the advantages. There are a number of people around who have had their foot in both places. The person who's helping facilitate this for us Mary Beth Fafford, who worked at Ride for several years, also worked for David Driscoll for many years in Mass. So people, thank you, who, who see the comparison are very valuable. Just one, one point, and I, yeah. I always like to interject myself in these sorts <laughs> of things. Um, if you take a look at our per pupil average, nationally it is among the higher mm -hmm. per pupil expenses. If you compare us to New England, we're not that great. So if we mm -hmm. equaled, the average per pupil cost across the six states in New England, it would translate into an additional $90 million for education in the state. $90 million. And that's just the statewide average. Yeah, that's the New England average. Yeah, along with that, and sorry, we'll get to your question. Um, if we could get among the best public education in the United States, if we can have one of the healthiest populations in the United States. And if when you drive up 95 from Connecticut into Rhode Island where you see URI, home of the volleyball champs, or whatever, we could say top five in education. We could say top five in health and health care. We would not need all these economic incentives we're throwing around to get companies to move here. People would want to move here. People would move here because their kids will get educated and they'll find a workforce. Uh, hi, uh, I want to thank you for your efforts. Um, and I'm a, a very new school committee member, probably the newest because I was just elected through a special election. So, um, so what have you done so far? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, right, right I'm here, hopefully with a fresh Showing perspective. Up. But uh, Coventry. So, uh, so as I, I'm getting introduced to the budget process and I look at this and I applaud the efforts for long-term planning. I work in government. I understand how hard it is mm -hmm. to stick to plans because of political wills. And, you know, I, one thing I hope is that we're looking at something in the plan to keep people's feet to the fire um, to survive these shifts in administration. Mm -hmm. But my other concern is that as I look at next year's budget and we look at our own budget where we're not even funding the capital, able to leverage the bonding aid that, we're, that came down from the state, um, we're barely funding through for this year, and we mm -hmm. look at next year, and it's probably worse. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we're exclusive. I work for the city of Warwick. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, front page of the paper. What, did you get another, out in time? Yeah. <laughs> they're like, another $8.5 that they're looking for. So I guess my question is, how are we walking and chewing gum on this? Because while the long-term effort is also important, 
Um, I'm concerned that we may crash and burn in the short term yeah. on the funding, and we may not even get there because while this may be a 10-year plan, we're going to burn out in year two where yeah. communities are going to have to make draconian cuts. Yeah, no, it's a great point, and that's where the rubber will hit the road. The, the, the concept behind this is we don't know where we want to get. So if we want to be here, which is what we're trying to do, we're going to back into what you're talking about. <clears throat> what do we need to do to get there? What do you need to do in year two? What can wait till year five? What, what's year eight? Year eight. That's the only thing. Otherwise, we'll do that every year. We'll have budget struggles. We won't have a vision. We won't know where we're trying to get to. We're trying to lock everybody in. The reason we're getting everybody to sign is so six months from now, somebody can't say, oh, I didn't know that's what we said we were going to do. Well, you saw what we were going to do. Now we have to figure out what to do to get it. But it's not designed right now to, to do. It's too immediate for what you're, what you're trying to do. But they do have to come together. There's no doubt, and I agree with that. Thank you. Um, one question is, will all of the potential changes that we're looking to accomplish here, um, I don't think any of this could be done without looking at charters as well mm -hmm. and how the governance of charters is set up <coughs> here versus Massachusetts. Because we have a parallel school system where Mass really doesn't. So you know, one, one side of the, of the equation is good, but it has to encompass some sort of revision in, in, in charters and, and mm -hmm. how we're going to go forward with that. Because that, that has an impact on virtually every single district. Yeah, it's interesting. It's and, and Tim can opine. We it, it hasn't been a big issue yet. I mean, school choice gets mentioned, but the the charters I struggle to say versus districts because they are district schools. Or there are public schools. Um, it has not become the biggest issue yet. It may be as we go down the road. I will tell you that when I retire someday, I'm tempted to start a charter school. No offense to your budgets. And I'm going to call it read and write and arithmetic. And I make sure every single kid gets out of there with read, write, and arithmetic. And I'm being flipped. But it, it, the alignment of that, you've got the learning community up in northern Rhode Island that does work with the district schools. It does help with the teacher training and reading and stuff. But, uh, but I understand that. But it is fascinating to me, though. It has not come up as a top it, issue it, yet. It hasn't because the charter schools are, are present as well. Yeah. But I will tell you that one of the big right. problems is reexamining the funding formula. Yeah, and I that's hope where it will show up. That, that this ends up being an issue for um, the new uh, governance uh, legislation to be introduced uh, sometime this week. I will tell you this much. The problem, 23% of your per pupil cost is defined uh, as special ed costs. And the state reimburses school districts for high cost special ed uh, at a categorical rate of $4.5 million. <laughs> which doesn't even match the formula that they put in the budget. It should be closer to 18 million. Of that $4.5 million, only one charter school is getting any of that reimbursement for a grand total of 3,500 bucks. So they don't take kids with high cost special needs. They generally don't take special ed kids. But when that transfer of that tuition from your school goes to a charter school, the 23 percent that you're paying for high, for a special ed is going with it, and that's a big issue. That's a big problem. They, they're getting, they have more resources to do uh, more with less challenging students. Warren Buffett has a solution for fixing public education. Warren Buffett has said, outlaw private schools. If every elected official and everybody with money had to send their kids to the local public school, that's where the investment would be and they'd be a lot better. So just as an aside to that on the charters. Hello. Good morning, uh, Andrew. Andrew Bramson from the Central Falls <coughs> School Board. Uh, this summer it'll be nine years that the state got its $75 million race to the top money, mm -hmm. what was then called a once in a generation investment. You were involved in that. What has the state learned from that investment in that process that can be useful to this effort? So. It would be presumptuous of me to, to speak on behalf of the state, so I'll just tell you what I think we learned. The one thing we learned was it was a grant. It was not $75 million to do what you want. It was not $75 million to secure education. It was a grant, the largest grant the state had gotten. It was a feather in our cap, but it was a grant. The other thing is that not enough was done to look at sustainability. So one of the, I'm not an expert on, L, yeah, I get lost in LEAs and all that stuff. 
Uh, a lot, too much money went to consultants, too much money went centrally, but there were programs like induction, induction coaches. So induction coaches, as I understood it, was for new teachers, you took an experienced teacher as a mentor, and they worked full time with three or four or five new teachers, and you had to replace that experienced teacher in the classroom, that took money. And Race to the Top had money for that. But for districts that could not afford to keep that going after the Race to the Top money went, then it didn't work. For those that were able to do it, it still works. Evaluation was a big thing in that, if you remember. Um, uh, you know, different commissioner, different dynamics. Um, I was the co-chair of the Race to the Top Steering Committee when I bonded, interestingly, with Marsha Reback. We bonded over cookies and brownies, and that was about what we agreed on. Um, <laughs> but what, what happened there is that there were a lot of things that were tried, the evaluation was tried, new things, and they didn't stick. So one of the things that happens when you look at Massachusetts that's not in any of this stuff that we're talking about yet, graduation requirements, which I happen to think are a big deal, right? A diploma at this school and diploma at that school, no bearing on whether they're the same thing. And all the college admissions people know that. Problem the last time around is we tried to put it in right away, we didn't give people time, there was a front page article from a parent, powers to be said, get rid of the graduation requirements. We need to look over a four or five year period of getting in really good graduation requirements, which again, would come in with evaluation, things like that. So I would say, let, big lesson learned, it was a grant, stupid. You know, we, it was not what everybody thought the magic bullet was, but I do think it opened up and a lot, a lot of best practices were exchanged. There were a lot of meetings that I went to where teachers from Coventry and teachers from Situate and teachers from Pawtucket talked to each other about what they were doing, but no silver bullet. So uh, I just wanted to mention that we've, uh, we've said a lot about proficiency, mm -hmm. but keep in mind that the benchmark here for proficiency is scoring in the top 50%. And if you have one cohort of students who's intensively trained on an exam and another who isn't, mm -hmm. A big part of that difference, potentially, is just that they weren't coached on the test. Yep, got it. There's a way around everything. Great. More? Neil uh, is going to stay around for a little bit. Yeah. Um, but but I want to. Yeah, I want to. Thanks for what you do, and, and thanks for your support. I want to thank him, and and we will convene again. Um, in probably about eight weeks yeah. when we get some finality to the commission's uh, work uh, and share that with you and hopefully um, we'll have a path forward that everybody can agree upon. But thanks, Neil. Thank you.